Hi, I'm DJ Ware. On this episode of the Cyber Gizmo, I'm going to be talking a little bit about Windows 11, touching on some of the security issues and also some of the controversy, as well as talking about what exactly is it going to offer and so forth. Uh, and then some questions that I have about it, and hopefully maybe we'll get some of your questions answered as well. And if not, please ask them below, and we'll see what we can find out. Anyway, let's get started and uh, see what we got here. Okay, so Windows uh, 11 was released sorta. I mean, it's released kind of as the as an insider preview, and we need to talk about that a little bit so that you understand exactly what is an insider preview and what does it mean for you. So first of all, it's a major release of Windows and the first one that's been released since June. It was released on June 28th, 2021, and it was released into the developer channel of the Insider program. That means basically it is, not, it's not even alpha software. This is like, okay, we're throwing this out here. We'll try to get some comments from you guys, figure out, you know, is this the right kind of thing you're looking for? Should we be doing something else? Is it too buggy to use? But it's really a, a place, it's not an alpha or even a beta because it, it is still in development. The specifications are still being written for it. So yeah, it's fluid at this point. We It could change dramatically. And so controversy at this point is a little premature um, because you're really talking about, you know, maybe just giving them feedback instead of making a big deal out of anything that's happening so far. But basically there are many features and there are designs and specifications in this that are just up in the air. They're not they're not gelled, they're not ready for any kind of uh, formal release yet. Uh, but what do we know so far about it? So it's the first major release of Windows since July 29th, 2015. Yeah, I know Windows 10 has had a lot of major releases under the hood, but as far as the actual label, it is the first release that has occurred since Windows 10 was first released. Now, what Microsoft does under the under the covers, that's not material to me, but this is, I, I think they, I mean, from a marketing perspective, you would only go to a major version like this if this was representing a major shift in your way of thinking. And I think that's their intent here, that this is supposed to represent a, a turning point in their direction. So it's free to existing customers if you're using Windows 10 already. Uh, although I know updates from 8.1, some people have reported it works, and I, I know they tried them out on virtual machines, but I don't know. I have not tried. I don't have any Windows systems to upgrade other than one that I use for testing that's a Windows 10. I'll probably be doing the upgrade to it. I'm just, I don't like to mess with stuff on the technology previews. I put it out on a virtual machine, and I've been playing around with it, but I don't want to put it on my hardware until... It gets a little closer <laughs> in development and a little bit more solid. Uh, yeah, so Microsoft is really at talking about security here. They're talking about the flaws that have gone before. And I think they're talking about Spectre Meltdown. I think they're also talking about, you know, the ability to infiltrate using applications that are have malware in them and and are you getting what you really think you're getting when you download an application other than from the protected store environment? So they're really concerned about that, and they're in, they're concerned about that on Intel, AMD, and ARM uh, because uh, you know they do run they do run uh, Windows 10 on ARM uh, with their systems. There's those are chips from Qualcomm. So Microsoft has been thinking about restricting the, the CPUs that are going into this release and the initial set of supported CPUs seem to indicate, at least on the Intel side, eighth generation from the uh, Ryzen side. Of course, you know, there's more to it than just Ryzen and Intel Core. There's also support for different Atom, different, cent uh, different uh, uh, Xeon chips. There's also... Uh, all of the all of the full line of Athlon and Ryzen and all of that all the way up. 
So, yeah, like Epic and all those systems as well. So if you're interested, you might want to go out to the Windows site. There is a link there that you can go and look at the different CPU specs that they're supporting. So <clears throat> the other thing that they're, they're requiring in this is TPM, which is the Trusted Program Module. Uh, and that is going to be required, uh, at least in the initial release here. I don't know what their plans are long term. I don't, I'm not a member of the Microsoft development team, so I have no clue what they're doing internally, and nor do I really want to. Uh, I do know that they have stated they will require UF, UEFI and Secure Boot to be uh, used. So if you have an older, older board that only has a BIOS, probably out of luck. Um, so what's new? What are they really doing here? So, so on one hand, they're offering a fresh desktop uh, UI and UX, user interface, user experience. Uh, and the focus is to try to streamline the workflow that we go through. I, I remember when I used Windows, it always seemed to be click happy and keyboard happy whenever you were trying to do anything inside of any of their software. So they're trying to really streamline that down to minimize the number of clicks, minimize the number of key presses that you have in order to send commands to the uh, environment or to the application to have it control something. So they're also adding the support for nearly 500,000 uh, Android apps. They have a uh, an application that allows them to run Android apps. They will appear, as I understand it, in the start and the taskbar. Uh, as their own application, they they don't appear any differently than ones that are written for Windows. They also appear in their own Windows, so you won't see an emulation screen, and then you have to load the applications from there. Uh, the way I understand that this is installed right now is through the Amazon uh, interface, and so I don't know what the I don't know anything about how that's all going to work. Haven't looked at it. Haven't really seen much about it other than the fact that that's their plan. So they're also offering widgets, and this kind of brings it to my memory back to Vista. Uh, Vista also brought widgets along with it. So I don't know if we're returning back to what Vista was trying to do. I don't know if this is a whole new implementation, but they are attempting to add widgets to the interface, and they're providing a button on the taskbar to access those widgets uh, in, as a group. So Microsoft Teams, uh, that is now being built into the operating system for video conferencing or video chat. And, uh, and so that will allow a Windows user to use Microsoft Teams to communicate with people on Windows, Android, Mac OS, or iOS. I don't know what their plans are for Linux. Um, but that seems to me to be an omission. But then, you know, we're such a small user group on the desktop side, they probably just don't care. Um, and as far as the desktops, uh, you can more easily create virtual desktops. Uh, not much information I could see on that one yet. Snap layouts. So when you're working with a group of windows and you're overlaying and overlaying and you're covering up windows, you want to be able to f open them all up in a smaller view, similar to the way the Mac OS does, where you can see all of your applications that are running kind of in a view and say, oh, I didn't know I had that up still. Uh, or maybe I need to sh maybe I need to bring up the application because I'm missing it. But at least it gives you a, a way to display them. What they're allowing in the snap in the snap layouts is that you can control how you want those displayed. So yeah, it won't be just looking at it as one big mess or just the, the way Microsoft wants you to see it. It will allow you to create your own layouts and then. Snap groups is a little confusing to me, but it seems to me that if it's windows that are open by the same application, such as your browser might have multiple windows open, it allows you to group those together so you know that those windows are part of the same application. But it, I guess it's also working with the Snap layout so that whatever layout format you've chosen, that'll be the one that it uses to do that. When is Windows 11 coming? As far as we know, sometime this fall. That's all I. That's all I know about it. Uh, I've heard some rumors that they're thinking about, you know, moving the date forward. But I don't know what their date was to begin with. I mean, fall they could run all the way till December the 20th. <laughs> so, yeah, I don't know what they mean by running it forward. I have no idea. So, one of the controversial statements that I have seen a lot of people say is. 
is Windows 11 going to force me to buy new hardware? Well, maybe. Uh, I mean, remember, this is all cursory. I mean, we have specifications from them, but none of this is gelled. This is all fluid stuff, guys and, and ladies. This is something that you can't just say, oh, this is the way it's going to be because uh, <laughs> it could change. Um, but this is spec is in work is what you really need to think of it as. So what we know so far is that the processor specification on the Intel side supports Atom, Celeron, Core uh, from the 8th generation forward, and Xeon, and there's a list of uh, Xeon-based processors that are in there. The same with AMD and the same with Qualcomm. They all have specs. So I'll put a link below where you can go and look uh, and see if your machine is actually there or not. DirectX 12 is required, uh, and just remember that Windows 10 only required DirectX 9 support. So, yeah, that could force you into a modern graphics card. I mean, DirectX 12 is fairly new. Uh, and a resolution of 720p, and that's a departure from, the, uh, from Windows 10's uh, support. Now, Windows 10 has a number of newer features like 10.5, and there's also this 10.x thing um, that hasn't hasn't really surfaced yet. Those may also require 720p, so I don't know if those are going to be any different than what uh, Windows 10 will be supporting. But Microsoft is really concerned about security and performance, and that's a hard trade-off because security always impacts performance. So, I mean, that's just the way things are. So one of their concerns is Spectre Meltdown. And that, by the way, is still an issue for me as well. How many years has gone by? Uh, <laughs> four? <laughs> four years have gone by on Spectre Meltdown, and we're still seeing uh, processors that are not fully protected. So I recently did a, a test, and it was recently as of yesterday, did a test on all my machines again. I do it periodically just to go and make sure that one, there hasn't been any new findings in the Spectre Meltdown. And two, just to check to see if there's been any patches that have come from... Now, I'm testing it on Linux, but I'm looking at it from the Intel side. Now, what, what I'm finding, which is kind of odd, is that uh, a Linux kernel 511 running on a 6770 HQ, which, of course, is a NUC, and that's fully protected. And then I go to another machine that is a, a newer uh, processor. It's a a 10.7, uh, 710U, that's also a NUC, and it's not fully protected, but it's running on a kernel 5.4. So, yeah, I am seeing some differences between them, and, uh, and of course, the 5.11 kernel is, is Ubuntu server, and the other one, the 5.4 kernel, is a, um, that particular one is um, CentOS, and so, yeah, that's the one I'm replacing with Debian. So hopefully that will be fixed uh, because of the Debian kernel that I'll be running, I think, is 5.10. We'll see if that addresses it or not. Uh, but the Ryzen 4 is fully protected, and my newer ARM chips are, and the older ARM chips aren't. So, yeah, I'm running into a mixed bag there. So is this still an issue for Windows? Uh, Microsoft apparently thinks it is. And so that's one of the reasons why they're looking to cut this off at a certain level of the CPUs, going by what Intel had said, that they would patch the microcode on the older machines, but then on the newer ones, they would actually put a new chip design and new uh, uh, microcode uh, that would then be used going forward into the newer CPU. So I think that's kind of what Microsoft is thinking as well. I don't know. Again, I, I don't have any purview into their design process. I'm just speculating, uh, as we all seem to do. <laughs> uh, the trusted platform module, um, I think I said trusted program. That's incorrect. Trusted platform is correct. So trusted platform module is an international standard. It's, uh, it's ISO or IEC 11889, and it's a specification to define cryptographic processors Cryptographic processors is hardware support or hardware acceleration whenever you're performing uh, particular types of events that require cryptographic uh, functions. So that would be advanced math, of course. 
So it's designed to speed things up. It's designed to make them the same so there aren't any variances in the software. So typically, TPM is, is a dedicated microcontroller. Sometimes you'll see it as a slot on a motherboard and then you have to purchase a piece of hardware to plug into it. Sometimes it's soldered directly to the motherboard, and but it is not part of the processor. It's always external. Well, currently it's always external. Should be careful with that because you never know. <laughs> they, could, they could stick it inside the CPU. They certainly could do that. But it is hardware. And, but there are there are software emulations for it. So there are software based implementations of TPM, <clears throat> and particularly in virtualization. You'll see that, and that's to allow them to. Instead of having to pass the device to each virtual machine, they create software that then acts like a TPM module. So TPM 2.0 is the most current version of the specification, and that particular specification supports PC clients, it supports mobile applications or mobile devices, it also supports automate, automotive uh, thin platforms and so yeah you'll find it in cars you'll find it in your phone you'll find it uh, in your laptop you'll find it in your desktop motherboards so TPM2 requires SHA-1 which is an obsolete standard I don't know it's uh, TPM2 was defined before SHA-1 was obsoleted but SHA-256 as far as I know is still a current uh, and they use that for one of the cryptographic functions which is to create hashes uh, what does TPM2 oh, do? So what does it actually do? What does this thing do? So it, it generates random numbers. Uh, if you try to do that in software, you try to use the device under Linux, that's a software implementation based on a clock and then some algorithm that tries to magically keep everything the same. If you do statistical distribution analysis, you'll find that your scatter plot will be clustered and you don't want that in a random number generator you want it to instead of you know clustered like in a circle you want it to be scattered so it's truly random uh, and the more random it is random numbers are normally used in cryptographic uh, hashes they're used in cryptographic key generation and key decryption and all that stuff so the better your random number generator is the more secure your cryptographic functions are. That's the theory anyway. Uh, so it provides public key cryptographic algorithm support, so that's your public and private keys for RSA, uh, which are used in your web browser for your HTTPS support. Uh, it's also used uh, in, in some of the other hashes as well. Uh, and so, yeah, when you're hashing uh, values and you reusing that data to do other functions with it. Digital signature generation, uh, are you, is this document been modified since it was created? That's what digital signatures are for. And verification, uh, and that we call that remediation of the document. So mass generation functions, uh, those allow you to encrypt certain things and not other things. Uh, as my understanding, uh, I could be wrong, but that's my understanding. Elliptic curve cryptography is a algorithm that has found favor. There are some of them that are soft, meaning that they suspect there are backdoors, and there are some that are not backdoor, <laughs> that do not have backdoors. So uh, there are a number of ECC uh, algorithms that are defined, and TPM helps support that. TPM2 also has a common library specification that can be used for key generation and key derivation functions. Um, besides being used in the public key, those can also be used to in, the, in, a, in conjunction with generating a digital signature and placing that on an application so that when that application comes up, you know it has not been modified since the author created that application to begin with. And so, yeah, and there's just a lot more things that you can do as well. So <clears throat> some of the concerns about TPM is that a widespread use of TPM was really not what it was intended for. It was intended to support trusted computing environments or TCEs. So, and those were never intended to be widespread use. In other words, they weren't, in, they weren't intended to be in your phone in your car, in your desktop PC, but 
the, the TPM is rapidly being adopted for that. So there's some concerns about, well, this really isn't a good specification. The specification never really in, was developed in order to support widespread use. That's one of the concerns. Uh, the remote validation of the software before allowing an application to run. That raises concerns because that could be used to track what you're doing, how long you're in the application, uh, and all these kinds of things that, that we as users are worried about you know, from our vendors, our operating system providers, and so forth. So yeah, that's a, a concern. Uh, TPM's original reason to exist was to protect against attacks. That was its whole purpose. So in other words, it required a user to become privileged to escalate their privilege state to root or to an administrator uh, level before an attack could occur and the TPM would protect that transition from a user level to escalate into an administrative user. So it's but it's really being used outside of its intended purpose when it's being used by your desktop platforms. So that's another concern. It's not, again, we have two design elements here that we really didn't intend TPM to address, and now TPM is there. What surprises will we see? We've already seen surprises with it. <clears throat> TPM has been used to attack and extract secret information, and there was an occurrence in 2010, another one in 2015, and another one in 2018. So, yeah, I mean, there are some concerns with it. So if you're worried about it, yeah, you have some valid worries. Uh, TPM can be circumvented, obviously, <laughs> as we have seen. Uh, TPM in, on the Linux side of things has been supported since uh, kernel version 3.2, and that's TPM 2.0 support. If you're on Linux and you're interested in TPM, you can check for your, in your there's a number of ways to look for it. Depends on what kernel you're on and what distribution you're using and what implementation they're doing. But you can check for it in your slash dev, look for a TPM device. It might say TPM0, TPM1, whatever. Um, but there's also a sysclass TPM that gets created. You can check there. Some of them implement them as modules to the kernel, so you might check your LS mod. Uh, one of those methods should help identify whether you're running TPM or not. As to which one will work for you, I don't know. That depends on what kernel version you're running and what distribution you're running. There are now that doesn't mean it's enabled. That just means it's 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 supported. That just means that you have the support there. There are sites which on the Linux side, if you're interested in actually enabling it and using it, to show you how to do that. I'm not going to do that today. Uh, so who uses TPM? Is this widespread? Is it <clears throat> a lot of people doing this, or is it just Microsoft? <clears throat> actually, no. Google enables TPM on its Chromebooks. Uh, Oracle enables TPM on its T3 and T4 servers. Uh, Apple has enabled TPM on its Macintoshes, and I think they've also got it implemented on their mobile phones now. I don't know how long that's been, but I do know the Macs have been enabled since 2006. Uh, the MSI had a device called the WinPad, and that used TPM. Virtual uh, VMware on their ESXi virtualization platforms have supported TPM since version 4.x of uh, ESXi. Uh, KVM on Linux has support for virtual TPM, so they, and rather than having to pass the hardware, they have virtualized, virtualized TPMs that can be used by each of the virtual machines that are supported and running under the KVM. Microsoft Vista enabled TPM for BitLocker, and I believe BitLocker still uses TPM for that, although I think that's optional. I don't think that's required. Uh, it just means that it's if you have it, if your motherboard has it, it uses it, and if not, it probably uses a software-based version of it. So it's nothing new. It, it's not anything that's, oh, my God, this is going to crash the earth. No, it's not new. Uh, there's been a lot of people using TPM for a while. But like I said, there are some valid concerns about it. Um, and so I'm just going to point them out. I mean, am I going to lose sleep over TPM? No, <laughs> I'm not. But I'm... I don't why I don't use it widespread. I only use it to protect certain systems. How's that? So uh, Windows. So the, <laughs> has Microsoft ever forced us to buy new hardware when they released an operating system? Well, actually, as it turns out, and I can go through this list, or you can just read it. But I can go, <laughs> as it turns out that yeah, there was Windows One and there was Windows Two. 
Windows One was nothing more than a, a text-based Windows manager, and it was pretty abysmal. It didn't. Uh, it was buggy. It crashed a lot, and it was ugly. Didn't really catch on too much. I mean, there was a few of us that were kind of nuts and you tried to use it for a while, and yeah, it wasn't much fun. Then 2.0 came out, and that actually had a more graphical look to it. <clears throat> it was also buggy. It also crashed a lot, blue screened a lot. Uh, and yeah, so it wasn't really stable either. But remember, this was all running on top of MS DOS, and so they were having to use the upper region, uh, regions of memory, and MS DOS was never written to do that. I mean, he had to. You had to be careful when you're up there playing around because you could just write right over top of MS DOS or, or change a device driver, or whatever that happened to be running there with you. Uh, yeah, I used extended memory or memory extends, and it just got nuts. Uh, Windows 3 also, also so 2.11 was the next release, and that got a little bit more stable. And at that point, Windows kind of caught on as a operating system. It was originally called the Interface Manager, for those of you that really want to know trivia. But the marketing people at Microsoft said, and I would have to agree, Interface Manager, no, that is pretty dumb. So what they decided to change it was Windows, and they thought that would be better accepted. And it turns out it was. Uh, but Windows 2.11 was really the first stable, stable <laughs> version. It just means it crashed less. It didn't mean it was crash free. I could tell, I could tell you, it definitely wasn't crash free. All you had to do was enable TCP IP and you were on the fringe of stability right there. <laughs> um, but yeah, that forced us to buy machines with 512k of memory. We didn't have to do that before. Um, yeah, I mean, all the rest of them worked on less than a meg, meg or less. And then all of a sudden, whoops, now we got to get into these larger memory machines. A lot of us had smaller floppy drives, and so now we had to go to the 720 KB ones. And, yeah, it just got, it, you know, you had to start putting money into the equipment. However, uh, we had to trade out motherboards. A lot of us built system boards back then, you know, built our own systems up. But, uh, yeah, the ones that if you bought them off the shelf, yeah, probably you would have to be buying another one. Windows 3 forced us to buy machines with 1 meg of memory and 6 to 8 megabytes of disk space, which meant you were going into a hard drive. Uh, OS 2, wow, that really taxed it because that was a joint project between IBM and Microsoft to build the next generation operating system. So um, the spinoff to that, of course, was Windows NT. Windows 3.1 continued development independently. That's kind of the uh, MS-DOS based one at the time. And OS2 was really a standalone OS. And, uh, a lot of people say that that's a, a microkernel architecture, but no, Microsoft never implemented it, and IBM never fully implemented a microkernel architecture. It's a hybrid uh, at best. Um, but it forced us to buy uh, a new 32-bit a CPU, so all of a sudden our 16-bit CPUs didn't work anymore. Uh, and you couldn't even run a 16-bit mode inside of OS2. Just forget it. It wouldn't, it wouldn't even start up. Uh, 4 meg of memory, 40 meg of disk space was needed. So now we had some bigger hard drives we had to go out and get. And those were pretty expensive at that time. Uh, Windows 3.1 also forced us into 32-bit CPUs. It was a lot lighter on memory requirements and disk requirements. And so it was a bit more popular than OS2 was. OS2 also had some restrictions on its ability to run DOS programs and so forth. So, NT came along. It also forced us into a three, uh, an 8386 DX. So if there was an SX, there was a DX, and there was some other one as well. But the, the DX had the double precision support, whereas the SX didn't. So, yeah. And then there was 95 that forced us to purchase, a, again, additional CPU memory support. NT4, yeah, and went to 486, so now we had to upgrade again. 98 forced that 486 upgrade on the other side of Windows, because remember, there was two development platforms that were going up at the same time. NT was really next next technology or new technology, and the uh, Windows, the legacy Windows, went off on its own. They came together at Windows 2000, uh, and so we had elements of both. That's when it required you to upgrade to a Pentium, and of course... The older version went on one more time, Windows Millennial, uh, and then it went, <coughs> died. So they required a, a Pentium as well. XP forced us into a faster Pentium, more memory, more disk. Uh, they also required us to go 
to uh, higher performance graphics adapters or display adapters to get up to 800 by 600 resolution. Uh, Windows Vista forced this into, into an entirely new machine and it still didn't perform. It, the performance of Vista was abysmal. Uh, it uh, required a Pentium 4 or an Athlon XP, a gig of memory, 16 gig of disk. I can tell you a gig of memory would not be enough. Um, it was more likely two uh, to run it. And then there was 16 gig of disk and DirectX 9 graphics cards. So then you had Windows 7 that just bumped it a little bit more and you had to have a DVD drive and you had to make sure that your graphics card would support WDD M1.0. So Windows 8 and 8.1 pushed this into multi-core CPUs. That was the first occurrence of dual, dual core uh, in the Intel world. And um, yeah, and then we were really start, we were really moving into 64-bit. But 32-bit was, was still offered. So if you had an older machine, great, it would still work. But they were really trying to move us to 64-bit. And of course, that doubled the amount of memory that you needed. And it also doubled the amount of disks that you needed. Uh, uh, eight, uh, 10 didn't really push too much new hardware, although it has as it's gone along in its in its migration in its uh, evolution from the starting point of 10 until where we are now. It has gotten into larger and larger footprints as it's gone along. Windows 11, yeah, it's, it may require new hardware. As far as we know, it looks like it will. Um, but my my point is that's nothing new. Microsoft has required new hardware a lot of times during their spec. In fact, the we used to call the um, the Windows releases as hardware drags, because if you upgraded to it, you were going to be upgrading your hardware too, just to be able to run it. So, yeah, <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's nothing new. I don't know why that's even a thing. Why people even complain about it? If if you don't want to upgrade your hardware, I have an idea. Move over to Linux. Um, we don't uh, we don't force you to upgrade hardware that often. Um, although there are people complaining still about us moving away from 32-bit, but uh, how long has that been? <laughs> anyway, so over the years, uh, there has the hidden forced upgrades that no one ever talks about. So the new features that come along that your operating system is now supporting. So let me let me tell you about a couple of them. So like the, if you're going to use a browser, like Internet Ex Exploder, uh, excuse me, Internet Explorer. I always call it Exploder, but... Uh, Firefox or Netscape, as those came along, you were forced into having an internet connection. And you probably had to have some kind of networking in order to do that. And you probably had to have some modem or some uh, some DSL or something, cable or something to be able to get on the internet. Video over conferencing required a camera, required a microphone, required a headset probably, unless you wanted to hear feedback. Um, Hyper-V required a processor with SLAT or with uh, uh, virtualization support. And uh, direct storage requires an SSD or an N NVMe SSD in order to function uh, to run games. So if you want to use direct storage. So, there, I mean, th there's a whole bunch of features that have come along that, that drag hardware with it. Um, and, that, and that is how we modernize our lives, right? I mean, with, uh, if it hadn't been for ver video conferencing, where would our schools be right now? Um, yeah, it's stuff like that that enables us to do things that we had never intended it to do otherwise. So, what's the summary here? What's the what's the down? What's the what's the wrap this up? What is this all? What is this all about? So, Microsoft is, I think, is really attempting. This is my opinion. This is not them. They have not said this. I know that on their conference call they were talking about you know security and kind of a broad sense, but. They're, I think they're attempting to create a more secure platform. And Microsoft, and I don't see anything wrong with that. That's fine. That's great. Uh, I think they're also trying to preserve the performance. I mean, people game on that platform. You're trying to make it secure. What are you going to think if you're, if you're working on Windows 10 and your frame rate drops by half? You're going to go, wait, what? So, yeah, I mean, you have to balance those two. And I think they're trying to do that. So... They're also attempting to streamline our workflow. And my God, that's been needed for the last 20 years. I mean, they've really needed to work on that. And it's good to see that happening. Uh, even though some people are saying, oh, well, it's nothing more than a Mac OS look. It's more than that. I'm not, I'm not, a, uh, I'm not a Windows shill, but it is the, I recognize it as being the most pop popular operating system platform out there. So come on. <laughs> If you don't talk about Windows, you're you're missing 90% of the market. 
So Microsoft's attempting to allow independent application developers to continue to produce code and not have to be a member of the application store. Wow, what a what a uh, what a interesting way of approaching that. The other guy, Apple, they seem to be like, no, you can't put. It. They're trying to restrict the applications coming on their platform unless they go through their store. Microsoft, I remember. Um, reading that they're also trying to maintain the, uh, if, an, if an application developer wants to give their code away for free, they're trying to, they're trying to support that model as well. Now, of course, there are, is free applications on the application store for iOS and also for Mac OS. So, um, yeah, <clears throat> Apple has done that to their credit. Um, the, the puzzler for me here is <clears throat> I see a few things that uh, in the holes in the newer CPUs that I pointed out. Spectrum Meltdown is a is is not a, a problem on older hardware, but some of the newer ones it is. Um, yeah, like Skylake and Cabby Lake seem to have they're fine, but they're then they work fine on Linux, but yet Microsoft is going to exclude those initially in their specification. So uh, from the support for Windows 11. So what does that mean for you? So I guess maybe we should talk about that for a second. So what does that mean for you? Let's, uh, if you're, let's say you're on a Skylake, you have a Skylake processor, or maybe you have a KB Lake. What are you going to do? Well, you can stay on Windows 10, uh, and they're saying until October of 2025. Now, in the past, Microsoft, I mean, like like uh, Millennia ME, Windows ME was supported all the way up until 2012. I mean, so yeah, I mean. No, I, no doubt we'll extend that. I mean, uh, yeah, and they'll watch and see how many people are going to move off of 10. And if they don't move, well, they'll support it. They'll continue to support it. And eventually they will drop it just like they did XP, and there's still people using XP. But I know I understand that a lot of those are, are uh, they're manufacturing hardware. So, And the company that uh, built, you know, built the machine, manufacturing doesn't change out their fabrication too often uh, that's expensive to do so will that be the case for Windows will Spectre Meltdown be an issue for Windows I don't know haven't tested it so what changes will Windows 10 bring for the Windows subsystem for Linux we haven't really no one's really talked about that yet what are they going to do uh, what about containerization we haven't heard anything about that we know I know that Microsoft does virtualization on Windows 10 Pro, and they also have Hyper-V on their server products. But what about containerization? What, do they have any plans? Are they going to do anything there? Don't know. Uh, will the uh, Microsoft Store open up to Android and to any Windows app? I think that might be the case. I think that might happen, but I don't know. Again, I don't, and I don't have a purview in. It's a question. And how will Windows 10 really be different from Windows uh, 10X uh, or 10.5 or 10.6 or whatever those are going to be called? Uh, by the time they get to the end and Windows 11 shows up, <laughs> Windows 10 may have already implemented those features because there are planned features that overlap with Windows 11. So that's just a few of my questions, and I don't know what yours are, but uh, uh, you know, for me, the reason why I let me turn that off. So for me, the reason why I really chose this topic today is because I'm interested in operating systems, and I don't really care what they are. I have a choice. I run Linux, and but I do respect people that want to run something else. I don't have a. I mean, it's not. A, I'm not. I'm not the boss of you. If you want to run Windows, run Windows, and if you run on Mac OS, run Mac OS. It doesn't make any difference to me. It makes a difference to you, and it, you should be making those decisions based on the applications that you run. Um, yeah, I mean, that's. I mean, what are your requirements? We're on the operating system that supports them. That's my opinion. It always has been. Um, as far as what will happen with Windows 11, we'll just have to wait and see. Um, as we get down the line, I'll update you and let you know uh, on where things are. But as far as the controversy is concerned, I think it's way too early for that. I mean, calm down. Just wait. <laughs> that's my advice. Just wait. Hope to talk to you again soon. Uh, please like and subscribe, and to my Patreons, thank you so much for your support, as always. Uh, you make a lot of things possible. You probably just don't realize it. I have been building up hardware here that I haven't talked about yet. I will get to that shortly, and I hope to see you all again in the next uh, video, and bye for now.